happen. I think when the Navy started off, they had a really good plan. They were going to build two ships, experimental ships, using commercial yards and commercial derivative designs because they had a rough construct of a new mission, the littoral mission, and they wanted to use some ships to see what they could do with it, which I think was a good idea. About 2005, things really changed, and that's when the Navy decided that they couldn't just stop with two experimental ships. They had to go forward with construction for the industrial base. Uh, in my mind, that's when the program really made a change. It went from an experimental program to a ship construction program. And as with any construction or production program, once you get into it and once the money wheel starts to turn, the business imperatives of budgets and contracts and ship construction take precedent over acquisition and oversight principles, things like design, development, test, and cost. So let me switch now to uh, a little discussion about oversight. On any major weapon system, milestone B is the most important milestone. Um, that's when you lay down, that's when the legal oversight framework kicks in. So your approved baseline, your non McCurdy requirements. B decision was made in 2011. That was after we already approved the block buy of 20. So mission modules, turning to those, those were actually produced before the Milestone B decision to keep pace with the ship. So what we had was, in my view, a highly concurrent buy-before-fly strategy on an all-new class of ships. And I think the picture for oversight for the frigate program is concerning. It's not going to have milestone decisions. It's not going to be a separate program. There won't be a milestone B. You're not going to have non McCurdy protections for the frigate itself. Uh, you won't have a selected acquisition report on the frigate itself. Um, and some of the key performance parameters as they relate to the mission modules have been downgraded to key system attributes, which means the Navy and not the JROC will make decisions on what is acceptable. So let me wrap up by saying that um, the ball's now in your court. In a few months, you'll be asked to uh, approve the FY8. Uh, you're going to be rushed again. You're going to be asked to put in upfront approval for something where the design isn't done. We don't have an independent cost estimate. The risks are not well understood. And oh, by the way, the mission modules still haven't been demonstrated yet. Um, you'll be told that, hey, it's a block buy. We're getting great prices, and the industrial base really needs this. Now, on the prices, you know, in my view, the block buy is uh, a, a pretty loose construct for accountability. Um, you don't have to say how much you're saving. You're not held accountable for what you're saving. There is an instrument that... Uh, exists for that, and it's called multi-year procurement. And the Navy was able to use multi-year procurement after the fourth uh, Virgin-class submarine. That, you have to ante up what your savings are going to be. You have to attest to the stability of the design. It's a real commitment. For the frigate, they're going to use the same contracts that they use for the LCS, and we know how well they've worked in holding down cost. Um, on, the, uh, on the industrial base side, um, as we've looked past the, pa the past 10 years, we've seen a lot of decisions made to protect the industrial base. And again, this is an industrial base we didn't think we were going to create because we were using commercial firms. 
Um, but my question now is, haven't we done enough for the industrial base? Isn't it time for the industrial base to come through for us? Can we get one ship delivered on time? Can we get one ship delivered without cost growth? Can we get one ship delivered without serious reliability and quality problems? So that's my question. Once the block buy is approved, your oversight is marginalized. Because what you'll be hit with in the future is we got great prices and we have to protect the industrial base. And with these two things, you can't change the program from then on. And I'm saying you can. I think that uh, your first oversight question is going to be, is a program that's doubled in cost and has yet to demonstrate its capabilities worth another $14 billion in investment? And that's the floor. That's assuming everything goes well. If you do think it's worth it, and that's a big if, I would say my counsel to you in FY18 is don't approve a block buy. Have the Navy do a competition on detailed design and let them compete the two, uh, the two ship designs and down select and, uh, and make it a major acquisition program with its own baseline and its own milestones and its own SARS. In 19, then you can consider if you want to authorize more ships. And that should be based on the demonstrated performance of the ships. And if you did, you don't have to do a block buy. Uh, you can consider what kind of arrangements you want to make uh, at that point. So in wrapping up, my view is you've got one shot left in FY18 to preserve your oversight power over this program. And my advice is take it. Take that shot. And uh, I can assure you there are picture, but facts are that the LCS was initially expected to cost $220 million per ship. That was the testimony before this committee. The cost is now doubled to $478 million. The first uh, LCS needed combat capability and mine countermeasures was supposed to be delivered in 2008. That capability is still not operational, nor is it expected to be until 2020, 12 years late. Served as the Navy's acquisition executive for the past eight years. Who is responsible and who should be held accountable for a doubling of the cost of the ship, delivery of 12 years late, and uh, obvious difficulties, which I will mention in later questioning? Who, who's, who's responsible and who's been held accountable? Sir, let me start with uh, the reference to the $220 million ship. Uh, that number that dates back to the 2004-2005 time frame, everybody here would absolutely agree that was unrealistic. And well, no, was, I would not, because it was testified before this committee that that would be the cost per ship. In retrospect, we see that it was unrealistic, but at the time, this committee and this Congress, which approved it, was on the basis of $220 million per ship. If we had been told it was $478 million and 12 years late for some of the programs, I don't think that this committee and the Congress of the United States would have approved it, Mr. Secretary. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm telling you that the $220 million number was unrealistic. This, well, this why Congress, was, this why Congress was it unrealistic was, to tell the, the Congress I, I agree. of the United States? Sir, I agree. This Congress was led to believe that the ship would cost $220 million. That was an unrealistic number that was put before, before the Congress in terms of a program to authorize and appropriate. The, uh, the result of the lead ship going to 500 to $700 million each, who that gave, was... Who gave that information of $220 million per ship to the, to the Congress and this committee? Do you know? I'd, I'd have to go back to the records to, to see who testified. The number was directed from the top down. The, I can tell you that the Naval Sea Systems Command's estimate for the program at that point in time was not $220 million. That was a number that was put in place as a cost cap for the program 
And uh, they pressed on to try to achieve what could not be achieved. And industry followed suit. Uh, and we, and we, have, we have the, uh, the experience of the leadership in terms of things that went wrong that we've been trying to recover from since. 17 years, $700 million of taxpayers' money has been sunk into the remote multi-mission vehicle. Program was canceled earlier this year due to unsatisfactory performance, reliability, and Navy formulated a new way ahead for mine countermeasures mission. For nearly a decade, the GAO has reported the Navy was buying this system before they were proven. Dr. Gilmore reported the MR, RMMVs were not effective. Why did the Navy recommit to the RMMV in 2010 after a non McCurdy breach revealed a shoddy business case for the system to continue development? Yes, sir. 2010 time frame, we went through the non McCurdy process and we looked at uh, a couple key things. One was the performance uh, issues that we were having with the RMMV and whether or not we believed that we could correct the reliability issues through a reliability improvement program. And obviously you couldn't. Correct. We, we, we failed in that assessment. We believed we could. We did a redesign effort. We did not go back and build new vehicles in accordance with the redesign. What we did was took the existing vehicles and backfit what fixes we could and took that to test. Which obviously didn't work since now they, it's been abandoned, right? Yes, sir. One more question, uh, Admiral. Uh, of the major casualties encountered to date, are these issues of ship design, inferior shipbuilding quality, a lack of procedural compliance, a lack of training, or something else? Who's been held accountable? 2013 generator failures, 190, that's on the LCS-1, 195 days and 1.6 million to fix. Seawater contamination, the combining year, 20 year, days and 377,000. 2016, contamination of a main engine, 258 days and $12 million to fix. LCS-3, uh, 2016, uh, combined gear bearings, 184 days and $5.6 million to fix. LCS-4 in 2016, water jet failure, 24 days, and we don't know the cost. To LCS-5 in 2015, high-speed clutch failure, 355 days and counting. LCS-8 in 2016, water jet failure. Uh, what? what? What, what's going on here, Admiral? Uh, and who's held accountable? Yes, sir. Um, in uh, starting specifically back in the early part of this year, uh, when with the Fort Worth failure associated with personnel errors on the USS Fort Worth, uh, I started to look very hard at the training and the qualification of the men and women that serve on our ships to see if we had shortchanged them with respect to the uh, the training that they had been provided. Who's held accountable for that? Uh, they were not well trained. Somebody's supposed to train them. Absolutely, sir. Was it you that was in charge of that? I am responsible for training the men and women on these ships. Should you be in your job? Yes, sir. I believe I'm capable of fulfilling the responsibilities. What I did find was that the training that we had provided to the young men and women was insufficient in reviewing two casualties and specifically the one on the Fort Worth and the one on the Freedom. These, uh, the men and women, when we, I stepped back and got our surface warfare officer school to conduct an assessment of the engineering uh, uh, knowledge of the men and women on the ships, it was found to be deficient. One of the things that we found was that, and, and that I directed, was that we start to uh, import much more of the training that we've been relying on for the vendors to provide to our sailors that serve on these ships. And so given the fact that we have uh, pulled that engineering training in, given the fact that we have, uh, are moving to get the curriculum necessary in order to be able to get the right knowledge into their heads in order to operate the propulsion plants, I think we're in a much better place going forward. Specifically, Problem with training. Who was responsible for the training? Wasn't someone? It wasn't anticipated that the crew would have to be well trained to avoid these tens of millions of dollars of, of problems? 
Uh, absolutely, sir. And I feel that uh, uh, as we have operated the ships and as we have learned about these new propulsion plants. I'm glad we have learned at the cost of the taxpayers of tens of millions of dollars. Senator Reid. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Stackley, uh, in the letter that the chairman and I wrote to the CNO, we talked about the replacement for the uh, LCS. And as I understand it, the current plan is to stop building LCS in FY25. Um, Mr. Francis' assessment is interesting. He suggests that, that LCS is simply going to morph into something called a frigate, uh, and we're going to buy frigates, but we're not going to have a, a real opportunity to review, nor are you going to have the opportunity, given the compressed time frame, to do all the requirements, to validate the requirements, to do the testing, to do the, the proving, if you will. Uh, can you give us an indication of where this program is, is headed? Um, is it going to morph into L frigates? Is it going to be a new design for a service combatant? Uh, if it is, does, does that have to be up and running by FY26 because we stopped buying LCSs in 25? Uh, sir, in 2014, we were directed by then Secretary Hagel uh, to take a review of our small service combatants and to come back with a proposal for uh, what was re referred to as capabilities consistent with a frigate. Uh, we did that review in the 2015 time frame. In fact, we uh, uh, briefed the defense committees and invited them to participate in, the, in some of the out briefs. And the, uh, the plan going forward that we then presented in our subsequent budget was to take the ASW mission package capabilities plus the surface warfare mission package capabilities that are currently planned for the LCS and combine them and permanently install them on the LCS platform to give it the multi-mission capabilities, trade-away modularity, but to give it multi-mission capabilities, add to that over-the-horizon missile, and add to that upgrades to uh, electronic warfare and, and decoys, specifically our, our NALCA decoy, in effect using existing capabilities or capabilities that we already have in development that the ship is already designed to accommodate permanently install them on the platform to give the multi-mission capability that referred to as a frigate that work was done it was chartered in 2014 done in 2015 shared with the defense committees at, at least at the staff level included in our budget the capabilities development document has gone through the JROC for validation of, of the requirements, and the shipyards have been turned on to do the design associated with in, permanently integrating those existing capabilities into their platforms. That design effort is going on today. The, uh, the competitive down select for that future frigate design, that RFP, is planned to go out next summer. We'll be doing those design reviews, and as I described in my opening statement, we will invite your, your staffs to look at the process, look at the products, look at the criteria, and provide basically your, your oversight, uh, and we will ensure that you have the insight before we go further forward. And will that uh, plan include a block buy of, of the frigates or a block buy of another group of LCSs? Uh, today, that is the plan. We don't have we don't have a formalized uh, we haven't finalized the acquisition strategy. With the 18 budget, we will be bringing that formal uh, acquisition strategy over to present to the Congress for your review and. All uh, yes, sir. I I, I think uh, all the previous. Uh, discussion and testimony regarding delays on the program, uh, uh, the LCS delays have been un unacceptable. And uh, 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 frankly, when we think about going forward and what we're doing different, LCS, DDG-1000, I will add CVN-78 to the mix. There's a period of time where the Navy went forward with all clean sheet designs, high risk, a lot of new development wrapped up in the lead ships. That's in our 
We're still working through those lead ships, but that approach is in our rearview mirror. We are not going forward with that approach today and in the future. So when we talk about LCS transitioning to a frigate, we are leveraging mature designs, mature systems, and that gives us the ability to compete this ship, this future ship, under a fixed price contract. Well, LCS and DDG 1000 were under cost plus. Well, but there, yeah, you don't need to elaborate on that because um, the fact that uh, uh, in 2013, five of the eight uh, L LCS delivered to the Navy have experienced significant uh, engineering casualties. Uh, and, and then it's, it just goes, it gets worse and worse. Uh, USS Montgomery, and we've talked about all this, but. Uh, Mr. Francis, you've been at the GAO for quite a while. How long? 42 years. 42 years, and you've been doing the same types of things that day, evaluating military systems and so forth? I have to keep doing it until I get it right, Senator. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious about this yeah. because you've watched all of this, and, mm -hmm. and one of your recommendations was, uh, uh, quote, uh, there are a lot of re good recommendations in your uh, final part of your statement. It says Congress should consider not funding any For the frigate, is this one of your recommendations? Yes, sir. What do you think about that recommendation, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary? I, I don't propose to halt production of the LCS in 2017. And as it relates to the frigate, uh, I, I listened carefully to uh, Mr. Francis's comments, and taking notes. I what I welcome is the committee, the GAO, uh, to sit down and look at the Navy's plan and whether or not it can be improved upon. We will take recommendations to improve upon it, but in terms of the fundamentals of locking down the requirements, stable design, ensuring that uh, we have a competitive fixed price approach to the frigate, I, I think all those fundamentals that you all would want us to do, we've got in place. Uh, Admiral uh, Rodden, what do you think about that re specific recommendation? Uh, sir, I, I agree with Secretary Sackley. <laughs> In his approach. Well, so you don't agree with that uh, recommendation and carrying out that recommendation as a partial solution to the problem that we're discussing? Uh, I'm sorry, sir? I'll read it again. Congress should consider not funding any requested LCS in the fiscal year 2017. It should consider requiring the Navy to revise its acquisition strategy for the period. No, no, sir, I would disagree with that recommendation. Mm -hmm. Well, for the record, I, I, I would, I'd kind of like to have you, elaborate, both of you, elaborate on what is wrong with that and why, what is a better solution. I know we've had a long hearing here and we've heard a lot of things, but, uh, I, you know, I read these things, and it, uh, it, particularly when it comes from someone who's been doing this for such a long period of time. And I would also say, Mr. Francis, I would like some time to sit down with you, not just on this stuff we're talking about in this committee, but on some of the others that I mentioned that we have had to suffer through FCS and all that. I'd like to do that, Thank Senator. You, Mr. Mr. Francis's suggestions to this committee. This is probably a question that can be responded to by either the Secretary or, or the Admiral. So one of Mr. Francis's suggestions is that we not okay the block of buy strategy for the frigates. And I'd like to know what, what, what would uh, that kind of strategy or are not okaying this block buy due to the industrial base and what kind of message would that decision by this committee give to the Navy's acquisition strategy in other programs? Well, well let, me, let me start by trying to describe a little bit about what the block by itself is. We are going to go out and down select the frigate to a single shipbuilder. We plan to procure 12. We want that shipbuilder to go out to its vendor base and uh, secure uh, long-term agreements with its vendors as best as possible so that pricing and stability across the industrial base will support the program. So, Mr. Secretary, if I can get a clarification then, the concern with the block buy is that uh, that it doesn't really interject the kind of competition that, that uh, Mr. Francis thinks would be uh, warranted. Was that your point, Mr. Francis? Well, um, actually, Senator, I think uh, the competition could be done uh, under the detailed design phase. Uh, my my uh, concern is oversight for this committee. Once you approve the block buy, now the Navy will execute 
and, and uh, I would believe they would do a good job of trying to lay out a program. But your opportunity to influence what gets done uh, is going to be largely compromised once you approve the block buy. So your ability in the future to make changes is going to be limited. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, you, uh, your explanation seems to go to the competition aspect of, uh, of the suggestion, but uh, apparently it has much more to do with our ability to provide oversight. And, the, and when we okay a block a buy, then we are letting go of the oversight responsibilities that this co Congress has. Can you respond to that aspect? I d I each ships in the block buy. There is no termination liability or cancellation ceiling that the Congress is taking on responsibility for, and you will have absolute insight and oversight of the program each step of the way. Well, what I'm sorry. You know, that, that that's all well and good, but the, the entire history of this program has been that, yes, we've always had that oversight. That, uh, um, decision-making capability, but, you know, you go down a path, and next thing you know, a ship is costing twice what it originally started because we've gone, gone down a particular path. And I think we're at the point where, from listening to all of this testimony, that we want to have reassurances that going forward that, uh, that, that we're not going to just get, uh, throw more money into a program that is going to continue to haunt us with uh, a lack of capability and unreliability and all the other factors that have been uh, brought to light. And I realize you sit here and you reassure us that that's been the, the case at, at every hearing with regard to this program. But I'm looking for something very concrete that we can do that, that um, uh, enables us to get the kind of product that the taxpayers are paying for. Aside from your reassurances, is there something very specific that you are going to do that is going to uh, result in the kind of product that we're paying for? Well, let, let me just start to go down the list. We're, unlike the start of this program, we're not going to suffer through requirements, churn, and instability. We're not going to uh, introduce new design late in production mm -hmm. that's going to cause costs to go through the roof. We're not going to put these ships under contract in a cost-plus environment where the government owns responsibility for the cost itself. I think Mr. Francis's concerns about a milestone B, I'd, I'd be happy to sit down with uh, the committee staff and walk through what you need to ensure that you do, in fact, have confidence that all the uh, 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 statutory requirements in terms of cost estimates, in terms of acquisition program, baselines in terms of requirements documentations, just like a milestone B. We will prepare that for you. We will prepare that for you. And we will, we will walk through it with you. And if we, if we need to establish a pseudo milestone B or a milestone B, I, I don't hesitate to do that, ma'am. Thank you. I think it's really important that we have those kinds of very specific items that you're going to follow, just as the initial testimony was that this, uh, uh, the, these ships uh, would cost them $200 million. And we're, you, know, you, you have been asked to, to um, uh, justify the kind of changes. So, yes, it would be good for us to have some very specific items that we can check off as uh, we go forward, if I, we go forward with this. I, I, recommend, I, Thank work you very with, much. I recommend I work with the committee staff and we come up with uh, the agreed plan in that regard going forward. Thank you. Although there aren't legal requirements for the, you to approve ships under a block buy, if, if past history is any indication, if you try to alter the plan, try to reduce the number of ships, you'll be told you're going to jeopardize our prices and you're going to affect the industrial base. So pressure will be brought to bear mm -hmm. to keep things the way they are. I understand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Francis. I totally agree, and I've seen that movie before. And uh, this this idea of a block buy before it's a mature system is absolutely insane. And again, two hundred twenty million dollars per ship, Mr. Sackley, you, Secretary Sackley, you say that was was really bogus. We can only go by the by the numbers that were given. Again, who gave us that? 
Do you know? Do you know who, who gave us the $220 million per ship instead of the 478 that it costs today? Do you know who that unknown bureaucrat was? Uh, sir, I believe it was uniform leadership in the Navy at that time. It was all the uniform Navy that, that was responsible for it. I didn't know that the uniform Navy was responsible for the, this kind of uh, uh, acquisition. I thought it was the civilian side. Senator Ayad. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to thank the Chairman for his very important focus uh, on the issues with the LCS. And uh, I want to also thank Mr. Francis for his very good insight as to how we could try to really bring back some real oversight over, over this and, and the cost overrun. So I thank you for that. Um, Dr. Gilmore, um, I want to, on a different topic, wanted to ask you, um, right now uh, ot and &E is currently planning an F-35 versus A-10 comparison test. And I also want to thank the chairman uh, for the work that we've done together uh, to make sure that there's not a premature retirement of the A-10 because of its important capacity to provide close air support uh, for our troops uh, on the ground and the importance of, of that close air support. Uh, so I've been getting some mixed signals uh, between uh, the, what, what has been happening with the Air Force. Uh, the Air Force Secretary testified before this committee uh, that the A-10, that in fact the F-35 won't replace the A-10. And so this comparison uh, testing for what happens in terms of close air support is very, very important. And in fact, I uh, want to thank the chairman as well for working, uh, and it was an honor to work with him to make sure uh, that there are provisions in the NDA, which we are going to consider short, uh, shortly, hopefully next week, that will make sure that this comparison test is done before there is any um, retirement of the A-10. So I want to... Uh, ask you where the comparison test process is and also um, how that process will be conducted in a thorough way. Um, I, in conjunction with the commander of the Navy's Operational Test and Evaluation Force and the commander of the Air Force uh, Operational Test and Evaluation Center, the three of us approved a detailed plan for all of the testing in F-35 operational tests this past summer, including in particular a comparison test um, so there's a detailed design that's on the record that the three of us have approved. doesn't mean that my successor might not change that, but it's a good plan, and I hope that that won't occur. The test design includes comparison testing with the A-10 um, and the F-35 conducting close air support, combat search and rescue, and forward air controller airborne missions. Um, and um, it's a rigorous test. And if it's conducted, it will provide excellent information on how well the F-35 can uh, conduct those kinds of missions in comparison with what the A-10 can do. We're also going to be doing other comparison testing, suppression of air, enemy air defenses with the F-16 and surface attack with the F-18. And again, the, the justification for all of these tests, these comparison tests, uh, comes back to the requirements that uh, the Air Force Chief of Staff has approved. And those include specifically, as I think I said in the last time that I approved, uh, appeared before the committee where I read them from the requirements document, that the A-10 is meant to take, or excuse me, the F-35 is meant to take on the role of the A-10. I mean, that's just unambiguously stated in the requirements document. I understand there's been debate and testimony that's confusing about it, but you can refer to that document and it's there in very plain English. Well, that's excellent because we're going to find out whether that measures up. Now, the, with regard to conducting that test, um, my uh, projection is that um, the operational test for the F-35, which will include this, this comparison test, uh, will not begin in all likelihood until late calendar year 2018 or early calendar year 2019, um, because my estimate is that mission systems testing is not going to end until uh, July of 2018. And at that point, you could get a fleet release of the mission systems capability software together with the mission data file, which enables the aircraft to actually deal with the threat environment. And the Joint, Pro and the joint Program Office's own projections are that that mission data file won't be ready until the summer of 2018. You can't do meaningful testing until that time. Does that mean that the uh, F-35 is not ready to engage in combat? Um, until it has a mission data file that's verified and accredited, um, 
it would not have the capability to deal with the threats that we're spending $400 billion to have it deal with. Um, and we're, the program we're, dealing, we're dealing with ISIS in Syria and Iraq as we speak using the A-10. Correct. That's not why we're buying the Is F-35. Is the F-35 ready to, to assume that role? Um, there are people who argue it could. Um, I kind of wonder about that argument because right now the capability that the F-35 has is two air-to-air missiles and two bombs um, with limitations in close air support that actually are discussed in, that are significant and discussed in detail in the Air Force's own IOC readiness assessment, which states clearly that the current F-35 with the Block 3i software does not provide the close air support capability that our existing fourth generation aircraft provide. So that's a quote from an Air Force report. I, I have written evaluations that um, are consistent with that quote. Um, so, and then there are the problems with F-35 availability. Um, the fleet-wide availability is at best 50%, sometimes bottoming out around 20 or 30%. So why it is that a commander would choose to send an aircraft that has two bombs, limited endurance, low availability to fight ISIS um, is, I think, and the cost of, uh, a question. And the cost of an F-35 is, per copy, roughly... <sighs> You know, I, I hesitate to give a number. It's well over the initial cost estimates. I think it's up so, around, it's up around, it's between 80 and 100 million, it's coming down. And the cost of an A-10? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. Except that a the, lot A less. the A-10 <laughs> has the lowest cost per flying hour. Oh, yes. Uh, so I don't think we're going to have the lowest cost per flying hour with the F-35. I believe, it's, I believe the A-10 is 15 million per yeah. Yeah, I, I, time. Is can, may I follow up briefly, Chairman, on one other issue with regard to the A-10? Um, so, given the timing that we're hearing this comparison testing, uh, one of the provisions that's also um, that if the NDA is passed, which we hope it is, um, that has been publicly released is that the Secretary, one of the issues that I've been going back and forth with the Air Force on has been uh, the actually removal of not, not ensuring that the A-10 continues to be viable. And the 2018 budget request makes sure that the Air Force cannot remove any active inventory of A-10 from flyable status due to unserviceable wings or other components. So I think this is really important given the timing that you have just talked about, about this comparison test and what the A-10 is doing right now against the fight against ISIS. Yeah. The, um, so let me just be as clear as I can be about the timing. So if I'm correct, we wouldn't start training for the operational test in, until mid-2018, which takes about six months. Then the test would be conducted beginning in very late 2018 or early 2019. And by the time the test is over and the reporting is done, another year has gone by. So the report that's mandated in the, um, in the bill would not be available until the end of 2019 or early 2020. Thank you. Mr. Stackley, first I start with the premise that nobody involved in this process was uh, malicious or uh, meant to do harm, uh, and I, for, I want to say that you're one of the most uh, uh, capable officials that I've met in this, in this business. However, we could have had this same hearing today, and you cross out LCS and put in F-35, you cross out F-35 and put in the new class of carrier, you cross out the new class of carrier and put in the, uh, the future combat systems, it seems to me there's a, a more a deeper issue going on here, and it, it strikes me that it's our desire to have the latest and greatest new technology as soon as possible, and at the same time uh, control costs and do it on time. We're trying to invent things while we're building them. Could you comment on this larger question? No, Senator, I think, uh, I think you nailed it right there. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time reviewing programs that either have failed or have uh, just gone out of bounds in terms of cost and schedule. And uh, almost invariably, uh, there, there are common themes. One of them is a lot of concurrency in terms of developing multiple technologies and trying to integrate them at the same time on a major uh, weapons platform or major system. And there is... Uh, uh, the, and G GEO has written a number of reports. There is uh, an inclination 
uh, to underestimate the cost. Uh, and, Particularly and, of something that's never been built before. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, and then when you get into that contract environment and you get started, it is difficult to stop. You, you, you uh, press forward. Now, uh, on the other know, hand, if you stop and say we're going to fully test, build a prototype and fully test, then that's going to lengthen your, yes, your sir. deployment window, and that conflicts with the need of the Navy or the Air Force or the Army to have these weapons to meet current threats. Yes, sir. So, so what we are doing is, uh, uh, and this is a CNO and, and myself, we are co-chairing requirements reviews, design reviews, production readiness reviews, program reviews, and we're, we are challenging every requirement, every specification in terms of do we absolutely have to have that, or is there another way, a, less, a lower risk way to deliver the, the ultimate capability that we've got to have. And I, you know, I'd point out a couple of examples. You know, the decision to, you know, frankly, to truncate the DDG-1000 and to revert back to the DDG-51 was a recognition in the 2009 timeframe that we had overreached in terms of technology versus what we really needed in terms of warfighting capability. So we go back to the tried and true DDG-51. But that, but that decision made it likely that only building three ships in yes, one sir. class was going to make them more expensive. It's it going to drive cost into those three ships. The but first it, DDG back in the 80s was very expensive. Yes, sir. But what it avoided was the, the recognition. It, it recognized the cost that was coming in right. terms of completing that ship program. And then going back to the 51 and incrementally introducing the capabilities that we need to keep pace with the threat. Uh, particularly in the 51's mission areas. The key word is incrementally, not trying Absolutely. to... And we had a hearing on carriers, and as I recall, what we learned was we were trying to do too much in that's the a, That's in exactly the carrier. it. The original carrier concept was incremental over three ships. It was collapsed onto a single hull called CVN-78, and we are paying the price in terms of that concurrent development and integration on that ship. Okay, how do we avoid this in the future? Well, we've we got uh, the B-21 coming down the road. I gave you the 51 example on the next AMFIB, the LXR. We threw away the notion of a clean ship sheet design. We took the proven LPD-17 hull form, and what we're doing is tailoring that ship to meet the requirements associated with replacing the LSD-41. That was a year-long effort with myself, the Commandant, and the CNO co-chairing those two design reviews to get down to a, a design that we are confident that it's mature enough, we're not introducing unnecessary risk, we understand the cost, and now we're ready to put it, it into it, the it, into It, the it seems to me, though, that one of the...